uh, let me uh, tell you right up front, I cannot come to this country uh, without a sense of gratitude. <clears throat> I uh, had the occasion to fight alongside your lads on more than one occasion. The, uh, I would just tell you that when Sergeant Andy Russell uh, of the Special Air Service Regiment was killed in action in February of 2002, that was your first uh, of your troops lost. Uh, that was under the area I commanded. I would tell you that the, uh, the Special Air Service Regiment took liberal poetic license with whether or not I commanded them in proper uh, Australian independent ways, and it was a wonderful uh, relationship between us. But to lose him that early to a country as small as yours, with a military as small as yours, and the many since then, I also come here to pay my respects, and I don't forget the debt that I owe you, I don't forget the debt my country owes you, and uh, we'll never forget those irredeemable debts. I thought what I would do here tonight, because having served alongside people that uh, served in the finest tradition from Breaker Morant to Gallipoli, from uh, North Africa to Long Tan and Vietnam, I wanted to just put in context the, the world situation as it is right now. That's what I was asked to talk about. And I would just tell you that 9-11 reminds us we all make our plans, especially you young students, and then along comes life, okay? Who would have thought that the ANZUS Treaty signed in 1951 when we were worried that somehow Australia could be vulnerable to an attack? When we signed that treaty, the idea was the Americans would come to the aid of Australia if trouble loomed. Who would have believed some maniacs attacking the United States on 9-11 would invoke that treaty for the first time and you were coming to the aid of the United States that had been attacked? And I'm keenly aware that you lost 11 of your innocent citizens that day. Uh, but I would also tell you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, it says something that without any hesitation, you sent your lads in. And the first nation to join us after that initial thrust uh, 350 nautical miles from the North Arabian Sea into Afghanistan, the first ones to join us were uh, Task Force 64, the Australian SAS. And it was no surprise when that happened. Uh, but as we look now toward the future, what does an incident like that do? And what happens in terms of the relationship U.S. and Australia? Here we, I come from the Pacific Coast. I grew up there in the, in the United States. We consider ourselves a Pacific nation, as do you. You are also fronting on the Indian Ocean and in the Indo-Pacific areas of increasing importance to us. So what does that portend for the future? I thought the way for me to address this was to go kind of deductively and start just by a quick glance at the world map and then drill right down to the area that I first sailed into, the Middle East, in 1979 as an infantry company commander on board U.S. Navy ships. The reason I want to look at that uh, broader picture first is to put what is happening to your country and mine into a framework within which perhaps we can look at what's in the news each day and get a little bit of a sense of what does that mean as far as to the young people who are growing up today and the kind of world we're going to turn over to them. Let me start with, uh, with Russia and what's happened down in this area here with Crimea. A Chinese guy put it very well to me. He said that Ukraine lost Crimea, Russia lost Ukraine as a trading partner, something they needed badly, NATO and the United States lost Russia as a diplomatic and, and somewhat of a partner. It, there was some budding partnerships going on there in the 90s into the 2000s. But the Chinese guy who said this said, and the world lost stability. Now why would he say that? Why was that so uh, important to him. First you have Putin who is trying to destroy the state system and is near abroad and he is doing it by saying I want a veto authority over the economic and diplomatic and security interests of the countries along real close to Russia. He does not want them to have sovereignty over their own future. And so you look at that and you wonder where is he going to stop? Does NATO have the gumption? Does NATO have the commitment to actually throw an obstacle in his path 
and stabilize this situation. And there's a lot of question in that. I was just up in Europe in June. There's a lot of question about it. So let's jump out to this area here in the South China Sea. Now, up here, the Russians have used their military to do what they're, to destabilize these areas and create what they want. Down here, however you identify the motive, the Chinese have shredded trust between various nations that thought you could settle things by talking about it, by going to international mediation and that sort of thing. And they've done it by building these islands up down here. And the bottom line is, I don't think they use their military the same way. It's a much more complex and much more subtle problem. With Russia, I believe it is a strategic problem. I think with China, it is a cultural problem. They are using their authority again to gain veto authority as the big nation over the nearby states. And you, you know where they are. It's Vietnam, it's Malaysia, it's the uh, Philippines, the, this whole region in here. They want veto authority over their security interests, their diplomatic interests, and their economic interests. I, it looks like a classical Chinese tribute state model that you see there. It is not a bellicose send the army off and start wars or, or do little green men like we see Putin doing up in, uh, up in the Crimea Donuts Basin area. And then you come back over here so you have two attacks on the state system, the Westphalian state system that says you don't do that sort of thing. You, you allow nations their own sovereignty. And here you have Iran, which is constantly fomenting using non-state actors, what we call uh, so, uh, uh, some kind of partners, some kind of uh, surrogates, uh, Lebanese Hezbollah, and they do not they do not own Lebanon, but nothing happened in Lebanon that Lebanese Hezbollah, the Iranian militia, doesn't permit. In other words, they are trumping the state system inside Lebanon. And they are doing the same thing as we know down here. They, they've tried to do it down here in Yemen. They've been thrown back there. They've tried to destabilize Bahrain. And Qusam Soleimani, the uh, head of the Quds Force, has said Jordan is next. I mean, he's been very honest about it right up front, what they're going to do. At the same time, and here's where I want to get more specific for our discussion here tonight, you have ISIS over here that is also destroying the state system. They're literally bulldozing the boundaries between two states, and they're saying that no longer does a state exist, it's now a caliphate. And so what, what you find as a common thread is the attack on the state system in these locations. And with ISIS, it's enough of a change. What's happened is enough of a change over the last six months. That I thought I'd talk about that for a bit. Then I want to talk about Iran after the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive uh, Agreement that was just assigned, just signed, and, and see if we can somehow look at this in a way where the Middle East becomes more understandable in terms of where it's going and what that pretends for Australia. First of all, I would tell you, Lynn Joan, that the center of gravity of terrorism in the Middle East has shifted. And specifically, uh, right on NATO's doorstep now, right on Turkey's doorstep, is a, this Chernobyl type effect of constant spewing out of more terrorists right there on, in, in the geopolitical heart of the Middle East. And there is no indication right now at all that this movement is getting weaker. In fact, I'd tell you, if I was here six months ago, I would have been even less concerned than I am today with it. They are stronger today for all the having lost a few miles and this sort of thing. They are stronger today than they were six months ago or a year ago. They are the richest terrorist group in history, by far. There's none that even comes close to it. And they are holding terrain the size of Great Britain, and Al-Qaeda never achieved this level of sustainability. They portray themselves as the Sunnis' last line of defense. And you say, well, what's that got to do with me? I'll show you what it's got to do with you as we go further forward, because in fact, they're such masters of the social media that they are attracting recruits from the West in a way Al-Qaeda never did, and they do not vet them very much. Basically, send me anyone who wants to die, we'll turn them into martyrs and send them on in. We have young men and women coming out of the Western democracies, and we're talking about thousands of them 
and I'm, my next stop, uh, Russ, is I'm head from here into the Middle East, and the leaders there are scared to death of what this is going to return to their countries when these folks come home from the wars and what that's going to do to them. The, uh, the Al-Qaeda also never thought there'd be a caliphate in their time. So now you've got a caliphate out here. It's taking down the state system, which is wobbly all the time due to this, uh, the problem of the social contract between the governed and the people uh, the, doing the governing. And the end result is you have this disarray that is heightened right now in a way that no one is significantly impacting. Uh, one thing, a point I made <clears throat> to some folks a little while ago was that it's going to take time and boots on the ground to defeat ISIS, but if we don't get boots on the ground, and I'd, I'd love it to be Arab boots, I have, I have no interest in going in for another war out in the Middle East, but if it's not Arab boots, it's got to be somebody's because ISIS could win. And yes, I said ISIS could win. You can't just sit here and say they're on the wrong side of history, so they're going to go away. Any of you uh, students here who study history know that history is written by both good people and bad people. So it's going to be critical they suffer some kind of military setback so that we interrupt their recruiting and we interrupt their financing. Because right now, if this continues, they are not going to sit there and say, we don't really mean what we've been saying about going after other nations around the periphery. Right now, they're focused where they are, right there in Syria and Iraq. But in fact, they are going to inspire copycat groups and your police, your secret services like ours and all around the world are already seeing some of the problems that come from these copycat uh, kind of uh, responses. And part of it is, uh, it's not that they're that great. It's the very half-hearted and strategy-free approach we're taking to try and throw them off their, their uh, stride. Many of the people in the West say we no longer have the gumption, the political will, the unity. Uh, and part of the reason we don't is we don't have a persuasive strategy that allows you to know what it is we're trying to do out here. And I think as you look at this, uh, the defined goal by our president in the United States is to degrade and destroy ISIS. We have not committed the means to do it. So that means you've said you want to do this, we put this against it, and that's called bad strategy. That's a strategic mismatch. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing all that magic about this. So if you look at the dilemma that right now faces Turkey, you get a sense of just how complex this is, ladies and gentlemen, because right now Turkey wants Assad gone. They've been willing to turn their, their and look the other way about letting some terrorists get down there. Some of these terrorists have now turned around and attacked Turkey. They're in a very, very difficult situation. And as a result, you look at it right now where the country, the, the big cities in western Iraq have fallen, and what you see is a, na is a caliphate that is starting to gain sustainability. And I think when you look at the, uh, I go on their website, I like doing that, I like reading what people write about themselves, uh, they talk about their distance provinces. Very interesting. Sinai, Libya, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Indonesia. Interesting distant province of ISIS. And you see why when I come here and I look at where you're at on this map, why I would be very concerned about it. And I think right now what we have to look at is what nations would be with us if we decided to go after them. There are nations, for example, President al-Sisi in Egypt has come out and at Al-Azhar University on the 1st of January he read the riot act to the uh, clerics there of the Sunni religion. He said, you are getting the entire world afraid of us, they're starting to hate us, it's not a problem with our religion, it's you clerics and what you're saying every Friday at these mosques and these sermons. And we need a revolution in rhetoric right here or you're going to turn the whole world after, after the, the Muslim religion. So there's a man that we could actually ally with. And I'll give you another example, United Arab Emirates, the country Simon and uh, Mark, uh, old friends here who are on the CENTCOM staff, uh, we called little, little Sparta. The reason we call them that is every time we got into a jam, United Arab Emirates was with us. Uh, for example, when the uh, French and British had to pull their troops out of the 50 nation uh, coalition in Afghanistan, the largest wartime coalition in modern world history, 
Uh, the United Arab Emirates called and said, we know you're going to have to turn to the Americans and request more troops to backfill them. I said, yes, I will. And they said, well, we're going to send in six more fighter aircraft and another special forces company so you don't have to take, the Americans don't have to carry the whole load on that. Now, when you think that uh, right here in Afghanistan, in, uh, in uh, Australia, in Afghanistan, you were the second largest troop contributor in terms of what really mattered to put it bluntly, uh, sending troops not just that could hang out at airports but actually make a difference. You were the largest non-NATO contributor uh, out there. We can't keep turning to nations like yours and say we need you to do more. We couldn't keep turning to the Americans. So here's the United Arab Emirates saying they would be there. The King in Jordan, who always speaks for uh, moderate Islam, uh, the King in Jordan, when he heard the British were pulling out, he reassured me that you will still see a Jordanian soldier in Afghanistan until the last American soldier comes home. So there are countries out there that are quite willing to sign up and do the heavy lifting along with us. But we're going to have a very difficult time doing that if we don't have a coherent strategy or if we exempt ourselves and reassure the enemy in advance that we will not send our ground troops against them. Even if we weren't going to send them into Iraq again, there's no reason to tell the enemy in advance that we're not going to. Why, why reassure them? Just leave the uncertainty there. And besides which, it could very well be that the next president, now confronting the situation that is deteriorating, will have to go back in. So I bring these nations up to you because what we don't want to do is keep thinking that we've got to do it all ourselves. We've got to look at how do we create new allies, and then we bring in nations that may not be perfect, but we don't need perfection. The last time I checked, America hasn't reached perfection yet in its governing at home either. So I don't think we should expect perfection from all other nations in the world before we're willing to work with them. I'd also tell you that uh, if history teaches us one thing about allies, it's that nations with allies, with good allies, defeat those without. So we're going to have to remember that it's not uh, good enough for US military officers to be willing to listen to other nations' officers. They must be willing to be persuaded and understand that not all the good ideas come from the nation with the most aircraft carriers. This is critical because America has got such overwhelming military might right now, other nations could come in and feel like that they're just, they have to be junior partners. I'll be very specific here. I think that uh, Australia's moral and ethical voice needs to be heard backed up by your military. And if we Americans have disappointed you at all in the last dozen years, you'll still have to go a long ways to find a nation more willing to admit its mistakes, correct its actions, and listen more to a trusted ally like Australia. So I think that right now uh, what we've got to do is ensure that uh, we have a good strategy. I think we've got to get our Congress uh, off its uh, bottom and start acting like a Congress and making decisions about uh, declarations of using military force or not. It's up to them, but I think they, this is some, uh, an enemy worth fighting. And we have to recognize that in the post-Snowden era, after the secrets were revealed by a, by a person who betrayed us, uh, we're simply going to have to learn how to deal with this enemy who is much more aware now of how we were able to find out what they were doing. They, an awful lot of good information got out there and we're just gonna have to deal with this and the younger officers coming up today will face a much more difficult time than I did. And let me put it very clearly to you, I was never surprised once as the commander of US Central Command by what the enemy did operationally or strategically not a single time in three years. There's not many generals in history that can say that. In no small part, that was due to an intelligence uh, constellation of countries that shared information, and there were always surprises on the tactical level, you know, tactical ambushes, that sort of thing. But that's going to be harder for the young officers you have coming of age in your forces today than when I was in, that, uh, in the job that I had when I was wearing a uniform. I, now, let me uh, switch for a bit because I want to get to questions and answers uh, real soon. But first, I, wanna, I said I'd go through this uh, Iran comprehensive agreement because it's really changed a lot of things in the region. And 
I'll tell you why it's changed with our allies out there. There are five threats from Iran. One of them was a latent nuclear threat, and that's what we addressed in the Joint Comprehensive Agreement. But in addressing that, we allowed the adversary, in this case, to get relief from sanctions in four other areas, ballistic missiles, terrorism, cyber, and uh, maritime, counter-maritime uh, efforts to interrupt the, uh, the lines of communication in the Gulf. So what we did was for the nations that are closest to Iran, we basically said, we're going to relieve you of sanctions for all of these things, and you've got to live with it, and we are going to get the advantage that they won't go nuclear soon, we think. That was very unsettling. It was very unsettling for Arab allies. It was very unsettling for Turkey in some areas. It was unsettling for the, uh, for the Israelis. And you don't find many issues where you find all of those people in the same position looking at this. Where arms agreements are generally to increase stability, you have noticed uh, some of they called our Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of Reassurance, was sent in to tell them we will send, sell you more arms now to the Arab countries in Israel. That's a pretty clear indication that it's not necessarily a more stable environment when the Americans sign it and say we'll sell you more guns as a result to deal with what's going to come out of this. So you have to look at this, ladies and gentlemen, and recognize it is not, for all of its title, comprehensive. Now, I would tell you I've read it twice, and it's clearly written with the idea that Iran is going to cheat. I went back and looked at the agreement the Clinton administration made with North Korea. It's four pages long. There is not a single verification issue in the four pages. Then you read the one on Iran, I think it's 156 or something pages long. For, uh, for you young folks, make sure you read this stuff. Don't take what other people tell you about it. Just pick it up and read it. It's not that intimidating because a lot of the pages are just lists of people that are being relieved of sanctions. You know, not that big a deal. But bottom line is when you read it, it looks like everything's about, we know you're going to cheat and here's how we're going to catch you. So I think where we're at right now is we are going to have to recognize that Iran got out from underneath a pretty onerous set of economic sanctions. And for all the US Congress talking about whether or not they'll support it or not, if the Americans walk away from this, they'll walk away alone. That's the bottom line. There is no walking away from it. Under our system of government, the president can sign up for something like this, wise or unwise, whatever, it's going to happen. So what we need to do, I think, ladies and gentlemen, is have uh, basically two lines of effort. One is on the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy folks who are going to monitor them. We've got to make certain that from from France and Japan, from Australia and Canada, from all the countries that have nuclear physicists and all, that the IAEA is fully staffed and all of us keep our spies watching very closely to make certain that it is verifiable that they are in fact not going for a nuclear weapon. It can work. It's going to be difficult because they have used denial and deceit many times over many years to deny that this program was going on. It was not a nuclear program. It was a nuclear weapons program. We have no doubt about that. On the other hand, we're going to have to address those four other elements. In other words, if they have ballistic missiles, we're going to have to help the GCC, and the GCC are these countries right in this area here. Saudi Arabia is first, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Oman, this is it right here. Plus we're gonna to have to somehow incorporate Israel, Egypt, and Jordan into an integrated air and missile defense because if they start launching ballistic missiles, uh, there's gonna be a lot of innocent people die out there. Uh, this'll, this'll be worse than uh, any bombing campaign you've seen. The second thing is we're going to have to have a cyber monitoring center. Uh, their cyber folks are, they're like children, uh, juggling with light bulbs full of nitroglycerin. One of these times they're going to drop one of these and they're going to turn out the lights in Paris or they're going to turn off the London Stock Exchange or something and political leaders will be forced to act. They have done some really uh, crazy things and right now we think they've been under restrictions because uh, they didn't want the, 
the, uh, the agreement to go off track so that in Tehran they kept them under control. Uh, there's another element, and that is the maritime element, and I think we need to increase using the U.S. Fifth Fleet and build up a stronger coalition allied fleet out there to make certain that if they do try to interdict the lines of communication uh, that the world depends on, that we're ready to help. Uh, and this is not where the Americans need the oil. As you know, we are very quickly becoming energy independent right now, but the world economy uh, there are nations from uh, the Pacific, China, India, there are Europe, they need that oil and we've got to keep those lines of communication open. And uh, the last one is uh, we've got to have a counterterrorism campaign. These are people who without a nuclear weapon uh, went and murdered Israeli tourists in Bulgaria a few years ago. They went down to Mexico, they enlisted a drug cartel and they had a plan to kill the Saudi Arabian ambassador two miles from the White House in Washington, D.C. With a, with a truck bomb. And they're going to do it on a Saturday night. And if any of you have been in Georgetown, that's where the restaurant was. You can imagine the carnage that would have been there. Uh, absent one fundamental mistake, they would have pulled it off. They made one fundamental mistake, and uh, that tripped them up. I've seen the intelligence. This was not a rogue intelligence officer who decided to go do something funny. This was approved at the highest levels. They were going to murder an ambassador. And to those of us in the military, we look at ambassadors as men and women of peace. They're, they're almost sacred. You don't touch an ambassador. And they were going to murder that ambassador in downtown Washington, D.C. It gives you an idea that you're dealing with a country here that's not really a country. They're really a revolutionary cause, and they are subject to doing some really crazy things. So we're going to have to have some way of stabilizing and moderating their, their misbehavior or something very bad is going to go on. I think that you can make it work, uh, this, op this uh, agreement work. I don't think our negotiators could have done any better. I think after the Americans blinked when Assad used chemical weapons in Syria and we did not do anything about it, they decided the Americans weren't, did no, no longer had the stomach for another fight. Uh, and so at that point, uh, I, I think we were in a position where our negotiators basically got about as good a, a deal as they could have come up with in this case. Uh, and there are ways for your, the militaries to buy peace or to hold the peace or stabilize for a, little, a short time. I'll give you one quick example because I want to get to uh, time for Q&A here. Uh, I was flying back, you remember about three, four years ago you heard about how the uh, Iranians kept talking in Tehran at their parliament, the Supreme Leader, that they were going to mine that little spot right there, the Straits of Hormuz, right here uh, off the tip of Oman. And I was flying back one night and I was sitting there thinking about it and I thought what I'd do is we'd run an anti, an international anti-mine exercise. Not an anti-Iran exercise, so I called my fleet commander, 5th U.S. Navy, fleet. And I said, I want you to do this. I want you to pull together all the, as many nations as you can. And I, I was pretty sure we'd get what I called the usual suspects. We'll get UK, we'll get uh, France, we'll get Bahrain, we'll get um, United Arab Emirates, Australia. We'll get the ones who know that we can actually uh, put together a mine clearing exercise and, and make it look good and, and all. But I said, but make sure it doesn't turn into an anti-Iran exercise. You know, and everybody hates mines. I learned to hate minefields on the ground at age 21, and I've never liked them at all since, to tell you the truth. So I think this will work. So we went out there, and the first year we did it, we got 29 nations. We got Canada, uh, and we got all the huge ones, but we got Canada and Estonia, Singapore, we got Japan, we got Djibouti. Uh, we, had, we had every continent except Antarctica, and I was looking for a penguin to represent Antarctica. <laughs> use another diver, you know, and they came out, uh, they, they either were in the exercise, had ships there, you had some of your sailors there, and the next year we had 35 nations come. And the reason I give you this example, ladies and gentlemen, is because in many cases the inconclusive nature of some of the fighting <clears throat> over these last uh, 12 years 
you can start wondering what, what, what are we really doing here? Does, does this use of the military make sense? Well, the bottom line was they stopped. How many times have you heard them talking about mining the waters in the last year or two? Zero. They realized that any coalition against them had two parts, a political and a military. Usually we lead with the political and the military goes in and buttresses them from behind. In this case, we led with the military to show we could clear those mines again very quickly. And by having all these nations show up, that was sending a message to Tehran that they're bombastic, we're going to mine the waters, actually was creating an international coalition against them. They quieted down. Why was I so worried about it? Because about a year and a half before, some British sailors and Marines up in the northern Gulf had been grabbed by a Republican guard uh, force. They were, these guys were in little, little, uh, little boats, and the Republican guard got them. And they were arrested and taken up to, uh, they, they got cut off where they could return to their ship and taken to Tehran. It was embarrassing for the United Kingdom and Iran was flexing their muscles. And it turned out, we're pretty sure, that the guy who did it, the captain of the ship that sent the people over to grab the, the British Navy and British Marines, he never got orders to do it. He did it on his own. In other words, he just thought, well, I know what they want in Tehran. I'm just going to run off and do this. And I had visions of some nutcase out there dropping mines in the water and sinking a super tanker with all the environmental damage, loss of life and all. And so I wanted to do something to tone down the rhetoric up there in Tehran so we didn't have this act. You know, wars are often started by miscalculation, not calculation. So that's why we did it. And I bring this up because there can come a wariness in all of us when you have inconclusive wars, you don't see anything good coming out of them, and you start saying, we can't use the military instrument. What we have to do is use the military instrument wisely within a strategic framework, not you know, with, uh, with uh, ignorance of history and culture and that sort of thing. So let me stop there because this is the, the, the new situation we deal with. Iran right now is going to start becoming more part of the, the body politic. It's coming out of isolation. They would like to be both North Korea and South Korea. They'd like to be North Korea in the sense that no Western influence invades their country. They'd like to be South Korea where the international market is bringing them all the the trade that keeps the mullahs in power there. They can't be both. And so there's going to be problems inside Iran uh, as those young people who may not be overly happy with the restrictions on freedom are going to have to deal with uh, mullahs who are not happy with giving up their, their control over them. At the same time, you've got ISIS and you've got Lebanese, Hezbollah, two different groups, two completely different. One is coming out of the Sunni tradition went out of the Shia. And you have to remember that back in 1983, the Shia side declared war on the West, okay? In 1983, they blew up the French uh, paratroopers barrack, the American embassy, they had other embassies, they blew up the Marine uh, barrack in Beirut that we brought in to, to protect the, uh, the folks down in the refugee camps. Uh, it was about 10 years later when the Sunni side, what you know as Al-Qaeda and ISIS, declared war on the West. And I would just tell you that all of this is coming into a new kind of uh, relationship with each other, and we're going to have to accept the complexity of it and deal with it, not say it's too complex, I'm just going to go bury my head in the sand, or as one officer put it to me here, since I've arrived in Australia, we're just going to cut the Middle East off the map and say, I don't want to look at it right now. Coming home from World War II, the greatest generation, coming back to Australia and England and America, said, you cannot turn your back on the world. You cannot do it. And out of that came the United Nations, the Marshall Plan, where we actually helped enemies to recover. Out of it comes Bretton Woods and, and all these kind of things that we put together. And if we are going to live up to our responsibility, people of my color hair, to young people so we give them a decent world, we can't ignore history and say, we're just going to turn our back on the world. 60, 70 million dead had taught one generation, you can't go to isolationism. You've got to work together in this world. We're going to have to work together to address these issues, and I hope uh, strongly 
that Australia's voice is heard loud and clear uh, in, in all these issues. Let me stop there because I'd like to get to the Q&A and see what's on your mind and uh, let, let's have at it here. And if you, want, if you don't want to talk about anything I talked about, something else in your mind, I'm more than willing to, uh, to address it. So who wants to ask the first question? Yeah. We've got um, two individuals helping out, two individuals actually. First question right here in front, Andrew. That helps in both the end. I think you're good. Okay. Uh, I'll probably talk loudly anyway. But General Manners, look, you said there's an ineffective strategy in Iraq and Syria, and I'd agree with that. What's your idea of what would be an effective strategy and why do you think that strategy would work? Yeah. Um, what would be an effective strategy? Um, first of all, I was a general once upon a time, but it was long, long ago in a land far, far away. So I've rejoined the human race. My name's Jim when I come to Australia. Um, what an effective strategy would look like, again, go to the two parts. First, the political part. And I think we, that uh, we should see uh, a political uh, agreement among every nation that's willing to fight these people. We find f common cause with them, and that means at times we may very well have people that we are not always that fond of. They may not be people that buy into everything we think. They don't have to be. They have to be people who are willing to fight this enemy. So first of all, you get the political house in order, and you help all of them put together the strategy. I think the first thing the strategy has to do is deal them a significant military blow so they lose the sense of inevitability or invincibility. And at that point, you get every banking system in the world, every country, to go after their finances. And you make very clear that any attempt to support this group through recruiting, joining up with them, sending them money, is going to earn you a time in jail. You don't get to have a moral buy an ethical buy after you sent money to someone who does what these people do. While we're sitting here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, girls as young as eight are being sold into sexual slavery. Uh, and this is going on every single night. It's between 750 and 3,000 every single night. This is going on and they're traded after people get tired of who they have there. Uh, th this is something that's got to be stopped. And so we've got to get some kind of, of uh, I would call it a coherent, military financial strategy that can, can pin them to the wall. I think that the military side of it should not be an attrition fight where we send in troops for a long period. We go in just long enough with American, Australian, whoever is willing to sign up to bring a sense of, of uh, confidence to the Arab forces that are there. We make certain that all the forces are overall under the command of an Arab, uh, a capable Arab leader. And when you go in, you fight a battle of annihilation against the group that you can surround, not a battle of attrition that goes on a long time. Then you pull our troops out, and you bring them back and forth as they're needed in order to bring kind of, kind of in, incite the bravery of the, of the other forces there. And if they choose to really dig in, it's our forces that can best move against them right now. I think, too, what you have to do is go after their message. And that's the harder part. But when you have President el-Sisi willing to put his life on the line, and that's what he did when he makes a, a speech like that at Al-Azhar University, the oldest university in Arab lands. When you have someone like Prince Mohammed bin Nayef in, in, uh, in Riyadh who's willing to go after al-Qaeda the way he is, or the United Arab Emirates that's willing to put their army down into Yemen in order to stop what was uh, probably pretty much Iranian-supported effort to take over the country there, then you have countries that can do this with us. And I'd start with the, the uh, political, make certain that you go after the financial, that, that's got to stop. You've got, we've got to quit allowing them to get the money they're getting right now and then deal them a good uh, military setback. Same time, we're going to have to have Arabs who can turn this message around, Sunni Arabs who can turn the message around that they're selling. Does that answer your question? Good, that's good enough. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Sorry, a bit loud. Um, I just had a question with regards to, um, to ISIS. 
Uh, you were talking about the fact that they're openly accepting pretty much anyone who will sign up to, the, to their cause. Uh, but could this um, over-willingness to accept wannabe terrorists um, improve Western intelligence agencies' um, capabilities? Because there's essentially a big gap that can be exploited. In, in what sense? How would you exploit it? You have, you have a great opportunity to be able to send in double agents and okay. infiltration and that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah, you want to sign up? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, that's okay. Uh, it's a very good point. The, uh, the, it is a tough thing to do because you'll lose some of the people we send in. Uh, I think that what you need is a firm commitment on a political level to do whatever is necessary. Our countries breed some young fellows that would be willing to do it. Uh, we've had them take very difficult tasks before, uh, but right now we have an uncertain trumpet call. We say degrade and destroy them. Meanwhile, but we're not gonna send our ground troops and we're not gonna put our forward air controllers on the front lines and we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not. You, you, right now, you've gotta get the political piece right and we are going to have to have political leaders who can actually explain not just what we stand for as the Western democracies, but what we absolutely will not tolerate. And then you, you go in uh, with total, uh, you, you can run a limited war but you limit the war by limit the political end state. You don't limit the military means. You go in with decisive military means to end the war as quickly as possible. Every war is going to be a tragedy. The longer it goes on, the more innocent people die. So you've got to go in with everything you need and that would be certainly part of it. But you're gonna have a hard time uh, getting the leaders of the secret services to send people in to do this when you have such a tentative approach to addressing this problem. It, it's got to be a lot more forthright than what we've done so far. Thank you. Yeah, but the short answer is yes. We just have to make certain we're, we're all in. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Sorry. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Adam Gastineau, and I've deafened everyone in the room. I'm with the uh, Center for Moral, Social, and Political Theory, which is actually in the philosophy department. Don't throw things. Um, and I've got two questions. Mm -hmm. One of them has to do with David Kukulin's analysis of ISIS that came out in a recent quarterly review, where he said one of the mistakes that we're making in dealing with ISIS is regarding them as simply a terrorist organization. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. Okay. And also, um, a bit more to the point of my area of expertise, you mentioned Australia's uh, moral and ethical stance. And I was wondering if you would be willing to, to comment a little more on what you see that as being mm -hmm. and how that compares with the, the stance currently held by the United States military. Okay, yeah, good questions. On David Kincullen's uh, article, I agree with how he describes them. They're a political organization, they're a religious organization, they've used terrorism, they've got an insurgency going, they're holding ground, they've got some state-like aspects to them. Uh, they're the richest, as I said, the richest uh, terrorist organization in history. So when you put this together, uh, this is like Lebanese Hezbollah and Al-Qaeda on steroids. If you know, you, Lebanese Hezbollah runs a state within a state, a terrorist organization, they attack a state next door, Israel. They actually are supplied by Tehran. So you've got that aspect of what's going on with ISIS. But you've also got Al Qaeda, which is just a pure uh, terrorist organization. You know, attacks. You know, uh, you you see their attacks everywhere. You know, they're they're all over the place. And so, yeah, I think he's right. Uh, it's much more than a terrorist organization, and that means you have to adapt your response to address each aspect of what is going on. And that's one of the reasons I mentioned about going after them diplomatically and economically as well. Uh, normal, uh, just a, a, the average terrorist group, you can go after them with just police and military and do pretty good damage to them. This group's going to take a lot more coherent and broader effort because of what David uh, writes about there. On Australia's moral and ethical example, you know, I was listening this afternoon as I was uh, getting changed to come over here about, uh, and I, I listened to your prime minister talk and, and the opposition talk 
that Australia helps people when they're in the situation the Syrian refugees are in. And you can see people, you know, in that very contentious parliament you run, you can see people on both sides agreeing on it. Now, you, you've got to understand that the Americans, for whatever reason, have right now lost much of the affection of the world in terms of strategic, uh, morally guided strategic activity. Uh, I believe we can learn from our mistakes. I believe that we will come back. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Australia has shown a level of loyalty to the United States, not just when we were in the right, but perhaps when we were not in the right, that allows you a degree of suasion with us, but also you are not included in some of the decisions that are looked upon now as faulty in both moral and strategic terms. So unhindered by that baggage and knowing the role you've played in Oceania, for example, close in, where if any nation gets in trouble, they know they'll see your, whether it be your constables in charge of the Solomon Islands uh, thing until you get it settled down again or someone gets hit by a typhoon. You have a degree of moral and ethical uh, reputation that I think could help uh, ensure that in the future more sustainable decisions are made, including by the Americans, because they're sitting in this room or officers uh, who represented Australia's best interests and better angels inside my headquarters, I guarantee you. And they are, they are grim, they know what their job is, they can do it, but at the same time, there's a way to maintain your moral balance when you're dealing with violence. Uh, and just to show you that uh, even inside the U.S. military, there's a special role for this nation. <clears throat> a couple of us were laughing outside in the corridor beforehand. An Australian two-star Army general was the assistant operations officer of U.S. Central Command, the command that has got a quarter million U.S. and so allied troops in it. He had, on one occasion, because my operations officer is up in Washington, D.C., uh, trying to explain our strategy one more time or get from them some idea of it. Uh, so when we had to move the U.S. aircraft carriers, it was too, up to my operations officer to do it. The Australian officer got people on the phone, and the fleet commander was off doing a visit right then with the head of state. So the deputy fleet commander was a two-star Royal Navy officer from Great Britain. Deputy Commander, U.S. Fifth Fleet. The officer we were trying to support right then was a Canadian brigadier who was my personal representative in Jordan. And the refugee situation was, this was when that was worsening. So we had to move the carrier up in case Assad thought he might wander down into uh, Jordan uh, and slap Jordan around for protecting these refugees. The Jordanians were doing a wonderful job protecting these poor people. So here I have an Australian Major General tell a Royal Navy officer to move the U.S. carriers to support a Canadian Brigadier. I bring this up, ladies and gentlemen, because there is a very short list of officers that the U.S. will put our troops under the command of. And I'm standing in one of those countries, very few countries right now, to include uh, one of your generals telling my aircraft carriers where to go. By the way, uh, his last word, he meant it tongue in cheek, but uh, General Boomer Smith said, the next time I call a conference from U.S. Central Command, I'd better hear yank voices on the other end of this side. <laughs> so he said, kind of chewing them out, and here, here they were all doing this. Uh, but it says something about the kind of, they bring an ethical dimension in, and it inserts straight inside the command, and that is healthy for us, because not all the good ideas come from the country with the most aircraft carriers. That give you an idea of what I'm looking for? Sure, you're welcome. My name's uh, Bruce Payne. I'm a retired uh, civil servant. Uh, you've talked quite a lot about uh, politics, uh, military, 
finance and uh, you've only just touched a little on the economics. What I'm wondering about is uh, your views on how big a motivator uh, for all of the different participants in that area is the oil question, you know, both supply and demand. Yeah, you mean with the price of oil going down so much, can they sustain their, their nations? Is that part of it? Or you mean about how we actually fund the operations? Uh, more general than either of them, uh, you know, how big a motivator is oil for, uh, you know, people who've got, uh, you know, call them foreign troops, but also uh, how big a, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, financing um, uh, for ISIS, that, they, you know, they have a, a big revenue source. So for yeah. all the, imagine there was no oil in that area, would people be as interested? Oh, I think oil's had a significant impact. <clears throat> I first sailed into those waters, sir, in 1979, and a couple things happened. The, the mosque, the Grand Mosque has taken over. Uh, the Soviets move into Afghanistan. Uh, the Iranian Revolution, of course, uh, is, is gaining full, uh, full traction. And to your point, uh, the oil prices start climbing uh, big. And there is no more governor on the oil on the oil money coming in, and it's funding all sorts of people. The Saud family is putting more money into uh, some of their uh, the Wahhabs, the uh, the mosque effort, the international effort they have going on. Uh, a lot of nations are seeing tons of money go off and just get diverted into uh, basically uh, terrorism. Uh, that's when you see it really starting to pick up. I think oil plays a significant role, uh, but you know there's a saying you know in golf you play the ball where it lies. The oil's there. The, the world's economy needs it. Uh, the only part of the world's economy right now that probably doesn't need it is North America. And the bottom line is you can't leave China, the second largest uh, economy. Uh, to go downhill without thinking it's going to affect everyone else. And the same thing for India, the same thing for Europe. I mean, they need the oil. So I think the oil is a, is a key factor. I will tell you this, every morning I woke up, I knew I would not be given, I could not say, well, that's difficult. Uh, I wasn't able to keep the Straits of Hormuz open. Uh, the oil had to flow, and I knew that I was expected to keep it open no matter what. And so it was a, it was a driving, uh, a, a, just a driving imperative every day. That's why I went to that uh, international anti-mine exercise. Anything to try to keep the peace or what passes for peace in that region one more year, one more month, one more week, or even one more day so the diplomats could work their magic. But I think oil has been, uh, a matter of fact, I've heard of, a leader of one of the countries out there call it the curse of oil, which really is the answer to your question. It's, uh, it's made it very difficult for those countries, even if it's been also the source of enormous wealth. Um, sir, I'd like to ask you a question, a history question really, where the dust has settled. And it concerns the United States government and the Vietnam War, and also the American military. I noticed that your own Secretary of Defence, a man called McNamara, recently, uh, before his death he went to the University of Hanoi and among other things he said, we didn't know anything about you, I'm convinced that our war against you was wrong. The Commander-in-Chief of Australian Armed Forces in Vietnam told me to my face that the Vietnam War was wrong, wrong, wrong. And the man who subsequently became Chief of the General Staff in this country also went to Vietnam, and he also denounced it in art articles under a nom de plume. Mm -hmm. But what did you achieve in Vietnam? You killed two million Vietnamese. But what did you achieve for ordinary Vietnamese, and what did you achieve for ordinary Americans? I know that Raytheon and Lockheed Martin and Boeing, they did very well out of the suffering. But what benefits accrued to the people of Vietnam and to the people of America for your your, your war against that country. Mm -hmm. Let's yeah. hear what you've got to say. Pardon? Let's hear what you've got to say. Oh, sure. Happy to say. Um, the, and I appreciate it. I, I come down to Australia to hear people and what they think, not uh, dance around it. Uh, I believe that in the Cold War period, 
there were decisions. Yeah. To try telling the Vietnamese that. Well, I mean, if you, I let, let me put it this way: uh, there were decisions made about where to try to hold the line. You saw the French make the decision uh, against the Viet Minh. I think that uh, with the Americans, the idea was that we had to hold the line against a monolithic communist threat. It was not a monolithic communist threat. Uh, we know that in hindsight, but history is unregenerate. You cannot change what happened. So you look back and you try to understand what did people think at that time without the benefit of hindsight. Um, I believe that what happens there, uh, years later I was in Malaysia and I was talking, I would, went to dinner with a gentleman and he said, you know, he said, for all the wrong reasons you bought us time. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, he said, we had all the colonial problems that any nation coming out from underneath colonialism had. And he said, had you not, had they not drawn all of the communist help in to help fight you in Vietnam, he said they could very well have put Malaysia and Indonesia into a position where the internal contradictions of colonialism, well, I mean, if, if you want to hear, fine. I mean, it, it's up to you, sir. I mean, this is what I was told by a Malaysian, not an American, okay? He said, you bought time and you didn't even know what you were doing. And so I would say that from our perspective, uh, we, we probably would look back on it and say it was a mistake, a tragic mistake. Um, okay. Next question, please. Yeah. Through, gentleman in the middle. Sir. Uh, when you were speaking about Iran earlier, you mm -hmm. mentioned that there have been a number of omissions uh, from the negotiations and that therefore there were a number of outstanding risks that need to be mitigated. My question though is, there obviously is a rationale behind the agreement with Iran. Mm -hmm. In your words, um, what is the strategic rationale behind this agreement and is there a good side from it? Uh, because at this stage all we've heard are the negatives uh, about that agreement. Well, I think, I think it's hard to be real positive about the agreement when the Supreme Leader comes out and says he's going to continue his terrorism, nothing's going to change in Yemen, in Bahrain, in Jordan, Soleimani comes out and says they're going to keep doing things. But I think the reason I believe that the agreement uh, has got to be carried through with and we need to implement it as best we can is that there is not an international will to deal with this in a military way. And a mili another war in the Middle East would be a catastrophe. I'll just tell you right up front, it would be, it would unleash even worse than we've already seen unleashed there. So what you do is you look at the rationale being you limit the potential for the Iranians to get a nuclear weapon. And when you think of some of them saying they want to wipe Israel off the map or something like that, you and I grew up at a time when the nuclear uh, capable nations of Russia, China, France, Britain, the United States, we all knew the other guy didn't want to use it. We, we did not believe the Russians wanted to go to nuclear war. We came awful close at times, but there was a sense we didn't want to. The new nuclear regime that could arise, especially if Iran got one, appears to be one that uh, wants to wipe someone off the map. And so this is worth it, I think, to try to prevent that. But now we're going to have to address the other threats or the nations that are closest are going to feel very vulnerable. And for good reason, as you watch what's happened in Yemen or what Lebanese Hezbollah has done uh, right now, the only reason Assad is still in power is because the, uh, the Iranians are giving him full support after Russia's regrettable veto in the UN. So as you put all these conflicting, uh, uh, I would almost call them uh, channel, rivers coming together with different, different uh, threats, the one we have to avoid is the nuclear in the hands of a country that is acting like a revolutionary cause unconcerned with their own people. And that's why I think you've got the rationale for it is you've got to try to make this work if that makes sense. It is, it's just to prevent a nuclear 
a nuclear detonation. And I think there's a lot more potential for that than anyone wants to really uh, take a chance on. And this is the best chance I think we have. Thanks, General Matthias. Um, I just wanted to ask a question with regards to um, the lack of political will um, around confronting ISIS decisively um, from the West. Um, if we continue to let this wound fester, um, what do you foresee happening to the Middle East and, and the West? What, what do I think happened if what? Uh, sorry, if, if we don't act decisively um, with regards to the Islamic State, what do you foresee happening in the Middle East? If, as you said, if ISIS wins, what yeah. happens? You know, I, I believe right now we're past the point of no return, that it's going, we're, it's going to keep getting worse for a while. And the impact on the innocent people out there has been about as severe as it could be. I will tell you that I've, I've seen uh, refugees in Africa. I've seen them in uh, Bosnia. I've seen them in Southeast Asia pulled them out of the water there. I have never seen refugees as traumatized as I've seen coming out of Syria. And I think it's going to get worse, and the political will issue will not be addressed until the current American administration is replaced by a Republican or Democrat administration that comes in with a fresh approach, one that is much more embracing of allies and much more committed to actually taking action, uh, and that does not mean uh, that does not mean it has to be military action. I would say that America has got to engage more with the world and intervene militarily less right now. But if you align enough nations together, then should we have to take military action, then it's got a I would say the, uh, an international way to address it and not just an American way. And I think that would be one of the ways you avoid uh, ending up worsening the situation, frankly. Does that answer your question? Not really? <laughs> Mike? Okay. Um, Tom Worthington from the Research School of Computer Science. Normally I'd ask about cyber warfare, but you've already addressed that. So um, what about the pivot to Asia um, in all of this? Is there, yeah. it, where do we balance the, the, where the, um, the military force and also the political intellectual power is addressed? Is there a danger of yeah. spending too much in the Middle East and then not worrying about the part of the world closer to where we are? <laughs> Yeah, you know, at this point, uh, the, the degree of strategic atrophy in Washington's got to be addressed. I thought it was very unfortunate to talk about a pivot to Asia. Uh, and, and you hit it right. There's two parts of this. There's the attention, basically, and then there's the, the military role. Uh, in Washington, D.C., apparently we're not aware that half the U.S. Navy was in the Pacific already. Um, <laughs> they forgot about that. Um, and. Uh, a quarter of the U.S. Army, two-thirds of the Marine Corps, and a significant part of our Air Force. Furthermore, um, many Pacific nations had officers, like on my staff, uh, there even when they weren't committed to Pacific operations, Australia's voice or Japan's voice was loud and clear in Tampa and Washington, D.C., because their people are there. They're actually inside the top secret meetings. Uh, and so I think that it was unfortunate. It scared the Dickens out of Europe, I'll tell you that. Uh, and it also uh, caused a lot of uh, concern in the Middle East. And it uh, encouraged our adversaries to try and take advantage of weaker countries. Uh, I think that um, what, what we've got to do is we've got to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. And it's not that difficult if you'll listen to others and if you're willing to allow them to take the lead on issues. Uh, I have no problem allowing others to take the lead. I mean, why shouldn't Brazil take the lead on uh, maritime search and rescue in the, you know, somewhere between, you know, South America and Africa? 
and Portugal does it up out of the Azores. I mean, there's ways where the Americans don't have to keep feeling like they've got to do it all. And yet that statement gave a kind of an impression to me that we thought it was all about us and where we're going to apply ourselves. I just thought it was very unfortunate. It was not strategic statement. And I think we've pretty much recovered from that. Uh, but at the same time, it, you're, we're going to have to go buy with and through allies. We don't have enough money or enough ships to do it all ourselves in, every, in the Baltic and in the Pacific and in the Mediterranean everywhere else. It's got to be all of us working together. Hi, my name is Mohanad. I'm from Syria. Um, I just want to know um, what's your vision on the future of Syria? Um, everyone is talking about Syria as just only ISIS versus Assad. Um, but there are tens of factions um, um, functioning over there. Uh, the Syrian refugees are not fleeing only from ISIS. They are fleeing from all from the war that's going on that's not between two, two sides. There are tens of sides, um, like Damascus last week, where it was rocketed by 98 rockets per one day and by Free Syria Army or Nusra Front or so there are hundreds of people being killed every day by unknown people. So they call them a Nusra Front or Jesh al Tawheed or Jesh al Islam or Fatah or so they have tens of names and Syrian people are being killed by those people and all the, the international community are talking about only ISIS or Al Assad. So how do you see the, the future of Syria? What do you see Al Assad in it or not? Um, it's not only ISIS, so how do you see the future of Syria? Yeah, it, it's a complex region, and I don't have time in a few minutes to go into all the things that I agree with you about. Um, I mean, had, had the Lebanese Hezbollah not come in, and perhaps had the Western nations supported the moderates early on before they got ground to nothing between al-Nusra and ISIS and the Assad forces and and all, then maybe we would have had more options, but now I'm afraid we've missed the opportunity uh, to, to arm moderates and uh, assist them. Uh, I think it's going to get worse. Uh, I, you know, right now there's talk about whether or not Russia is talking about moving in military people to support Assad. You know, this sort of thing, it, you could just see it go on until it just exhausts everyone. Uh, and it's just spewing out terrorists, it's drawing in terrorists, it's causing uh, refugees to go into all the surrounding countries. I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. And I don't know, other than helping the refugees, I just don't see an international effort right now that can stop the killing uh, and, and come to some kind of a ceasefire long enough to try to, to put this back together. Uh, in UK right now, they're trying to put together a plan. I know some folks are working on a plan to use uh, Gulf monarchy monies to go back in with kind of a Marshall Plan effort, but that's stillborn until we can stop the violence. And I, I don't think as long as others can get in there, you can exhaust everyone enough. I mean, in, in come these reinforcements and they just add more killing to the, uh, to the equation. Uh, I think right now it has terrible uh, forecasts is the way I look at it. I think it's, it's bad and getting worse. I wish I could give you a better forecast right now, but I can't. Next. Quickly, gentlemen, let us your presentation. My name's Craig Mutel. Um, my question um, goes to, I guess, some of the picture that you painted about the complexity of the strategic environment, and being that um, even you know the Westphalian state is uh, yeah. is coming to some struggles, um, and that you know arguably is probably down to the, the rise of a lot more power within individuals, um, as as opposed to earlier times when. Uh, states had a lot more control and yeah. were able to do things. Um, you, you mentioned um, different elements of national power in, in, uh, in uh, coming to uh, address some of these problems. Hmm. My question is, are, are our political systems um, constructed in a way which they can apply those different elements of national power 
towards uh, the emerging uh, complexities in, in the environment? <coughs> and um, also, is the military uh, place to leverage uh, those different elements and uh, contend with the uh, emerging strategic environment? Well, what a great question. Uh, it's as if, going back to the earlier question on Syria, we're going back to a pre-Westphalian idea that we can kill each other over religion, you know, what, what uh, cut Europe's population by a third or more uh, over those, those years of decades of war. And I think that somehow we've got to save the state system and, and I'll, I'll get into why in just a moment, but we, we try to teach uh, in America that America's got two fundamental powers, the power of inspiration and the power of intimidation. And too many times in the last dozen years, maybe 20 years, maybe the Cold War years, we've turned to the power of intimidation instead of the power of inspiration, which is why I believe we need to engage more with the world and intervene militarily less. And why are we doing it? Because our State Department, our Treasury Department are perhaps not organized to compete in a way where the ideas compete. But our CIA and the military, of course they're organized to compete. That's what they, that's their environment. So we reach for these hammers when we should be reaching for other ideas. What would have happened in 2002 when uh, the Australian, the Americans went into Afghanistan, if every year since we'd funded for one boy and one girl in every high school in Afghanistan to go to the Netherlands, to Australia, to Canada, to America for a year of school, after 10 years of being there, what would it look like with that many thousand, tens of thousands of kids back home again with a different mental model of what's going on? I don't think we are using those kind of powers correctly, but they are still there, and they're mostly there with the least cynical. And you know who they are? The people who live out in these areas. The power of, and I'll give you an example. One night I was out at a forward operating base on the Euphrates River, and my Marines had captured a fellow uh, laying an IED. He has a little wheelbarrow, two artillery rounds, car battery, wires. He's out there whistling, digging a hole, and he looks up, and here's five guys pointing rifles at him. Not a good night for him. They bring him in, and they tell me, hey, General, you want to talk to this guy? It's a little 50-man outpost I was going by. He speaks good English. He's trained in Switzerland. I said, really? Yeah, an engineer. So I went and I sat down with him, you know, give him a cup of coffee and a cigarette, and we're shooting a radio. I said, why are you doing this? I mean, you're Sunni. You know the Marines are the best friends you have out here. Why are you doing this? He says, oh, you crusaders who want you out of here. I said, just, just knock that off. You're, a, you're an educated man. What are you, and you, I'm giving you a long answer, but this makes sense, trust me, bear with me here. Uh, and finally he said, well, you're right. He says, uh, in my heart, I, I, I hate having you guys here, but in my head, I know we need you here for a while, uh, and all. And, and he says, so I guess I'm going to Abu Ghraib prison. I said, oh yeah, you're gonna go wear an orange jumpsuit for a while, a couple of years, probably until we leave. And he said, well, if I'm a model prisoner, could I immigrate to America when I get out? <laughs> Now think about that. Where did that, he's literally trying to kill us, but the power of inspiration allowed him to talk to an American in that way. We have too often turned to the military to deal with non-military problems. And, it, and as far as going into countries and overturning them, you have no moral obligation to do that if you don't believe that there's a reasonable expectation of a, of a better administration afterwards. I mean, and I'm not just talking about Iraq right now. Take a look at Libya, where NATO decides they've got to go in, and look what's happened now. I mean, I, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to make a moral argument for Gaddafi, but I think that's the sort of thing you have to look at. And when you look at these, uh, the, are, are we organized right to have this violent global argument that's going on right now? It's mostly an argument. Yes, there's violence, but we've got to use education the way I think it's intended. And remember that if you didn't have your Navy and your immigration people doing what they're doing, you'd have a million immigrants a day coming into Australia. I mean, the power of what you stand for is very, very powerful as an idea. 
And right now, we are not fighting the war of ideas in a way that allows us, I think, to win that war. Next, please. Through the young lady in the back. Thanks. I can probably just talk about. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. My name is Leah. I'm an undergraduate student studying security studies. Um, you mentioned that intelligence sharing is going to be very difficult in the coming years. I was wondering how you propose the intelligence community should change or be modified so that there's less of an issue. Uh, you know, I, some guy gave me my coffee cup from CENTCOM. There's a thing called no foreign, uh, some of you have heard of. It says, and, and I understand why each nation wants to hide its sources and methods of intelligence collection. We call them the crown jewels. But there is no need to share the sources and methods. <clears throat> and usually you can clean up the intelligence in a way. I mean, frankly, I didn't care about the sources and methods. I was a four-star general. I just want to know the intelligence. So there's a way to do it where you don't compromise the parts of it that you cannot reveal in good conscience because your secret agents could die or whatever. And I think that what we have to do is, we again, we have to get the political alignment correct and all military and, and intelligence operations are run at the speed of trust. And if you cannot create trust across international lines now, when you come together, then we have to, that, that person, that officer's leadership is obsolete and they need to go home. You have got to be able to do this and there are officers sitting here in this room that I assure you had access to some of our most sensitive secrets in, in America. And they're Australian officers, they're not American. So I've, I know how it can work, but there's a special, uh, there's a special arrangement for uh, fewer than a half dozen countries where we're able to do that. We're going to have to use that theme and carry it more broadly because you cannot ask for, for countries to send their troops in harm's way and say, by the way, we know something that would help your troops. We're not going to tell you. It, it's immoral. It's, it, besides being militarily stupid, it's immoral to do that. So we have got to find a way to do it. But remember, it's built on trust. And we have got to make certain that we don't violate the trust either. And part of that is keeping things secret. When another nation shares their secrets with you, uh, the Americans got to learn how to keep it secret then. You know, because we can lose a lot of confidence when we don't. So it's got to be a process, and it's got to be set politically, and then it's got to be zealously carried out by the people down below. But I have seen it work, so I know it can be done. I'm, I'm not talking about, you know, nirvana out there. This can be done. Uh, good evening, sir. My name is Eric Berger, a former Marine Raider and uh, negotiations instructor currently. For, uh, for a preference to the question, I'd like to, you know, I want to think about Reclaim Australia and uh, the Reverend in, Reverend, Reverend in uh, Florida who decided to burn Korans. And the reason why I bring that up is how important do you see the domestic responsibility of the Western society in uh, limiting our isolating behavior towards uh, excuse me, peaceful Islamic uh, society, such as, you know, the, <laughs> the, the numerous uh, Muslims that we, we share our land with. Well, I, I think the most important thing is uh, that we explain that in our system, we believe the government cannot restrict free speech. Uh, and you may like that, you may be contemptuous of it, uh, but the bottom line is, for those of us in the military, if we swear an oath to uphold the Constitution, we can't turn around and, and insist to our political masters that they've got to restrict someone's freedom of speech as it's defined by the law. I don't get to define that. Nobody elected me. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, appointed as an officer. So in dealing with it, though, I will tell you that I was in numerous capitals uh, in the region. <clears throat> in many cases, they understood the issue very well. 
that, that we were, what we were dealing with was basically people acting horribly uh, and disrespectfully toward others. Uh, it, um, it was tough on our relations, but I don't think there is something, at least under the American Constitution, you can do to uh, stop uh, people acting like jerks, frankly. What you have to do is have such a degree of rapport and communication with those other countries that they understand you don't buy it one bit, you don't believe in it, you condemn it. I mean, I have freedom of speech too, and I made it very clear what I thought about it when I was the commander of CENTCOM, but the idea of restricting someone's freedom is not for a U.S. military person to do in our system. So unless I can persuasively make the argument, uh, you know, like any citizen, there's not a whole lot you can do about it other than try to keep open lines of respected communication with people who are being insulted. And I've seen a lot of insulting of people and uh, it's, quite, uh, it's quite conducive to keeping people like me and you when we were wearing uniforms in business because the very contempt and lack of respect like you're bringing up there, when you see that in a social setting or you see that on an international setting, it generally has the same result, creates hatred, and, it, and it's pretty darned ugly. But I don't know how we get around it right now other than trying to get people to walk in other people's shoes for a while instead of walking out cynically and contemptuously dismissing a religion. I have fought many times for America. I never fought without, because I did so much fighting in this region, I never fought without uh, troops who had the Muslim religion, both American you know, in my own forces, but also the other foreign forces right alongside me. So uh, there's, there's no reason for this to become, I would say, the characteristic of our society. Every society, I, I tell people, look, Jesus of Nazareth had one out of 12 go to crap on him, okay? So it, you're never gonna have it perfect. Uh, you just gotta deal with this kind of stuff, you know? Best answer I can give you. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Well, no, there, this lady's got a good question, I can tell. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Elaine um, I wanted to ask you, please, about a common contradiction that I think we may face. You talked about the US having lost um, moral authority in the Middle East and um, in other parts of the world, um, and about how it should be using more its power of inspiration rather than intimidation. And yet, you were also talking about our need to have allies with countries with whom, on many other issues, we may be and it seems to me that that is the contradiction. In a nutshell, okay, we're working with countries like, let's say, Saudi um, against ISIS because we have to. And it's the very fact that we have an alliance with a country like that yeah. that causes us to lose moral authority among the people in the Middle East. I don't think there's a solution to that, but I would love to hear. Yeah, it's a, no, it's a great, uh, sometimes you don't have solutions. You just manage problems. And I think the question is very good. You know, I, I remember reading about FDR, relatively progressive president, and he made common cause with Joe Stalin to defeat Hitler. So uh, what I tell uh, my young officers is the Constitution's not a suicide pact. We've got to keep the experiment alive. I had, I was, I brought this very problem to a former uh, prime minister of a country you're, you know well uh, in Europe, and he just laughed at me said, Jim, if you can't ride two horses in the Mideast Circus, you better get out of the circus. Um, he, was, he was not trying to be flippant. He was trying to say, this is the very complexity that we have to deal with. And I think that if I was to sum it up, uh, it was so nice when I was a young officer. I could make certain that not any innocent person died around me. I, could, I knew my troops, I knew them all. And as I went up higher, I had to deal more and more with polarities. And nothing was black and white anymore, it was gray. And dealing with those polarities was very exasperating. So what you end up having to do is recognizing that you do the best you can with the information you have at the time. And you try to keep a moral balance uh, with it, but not to the point that you decide, I, I'll give you an example, we can align with or ally with countries that have at least the effort there to be responsive governments to their people. As I watched uh, the Arab Spring break out, 
I was thinking, you know, all these people are saying, oh, they're going for democracy. My CIA gals, they said, we're not so sure about this, General. There's a lot of decisions to be made. They said, what's going on here is Paris 1789. People who are furious about unjust, unresponsive governments are fleeing from them. They are not necessarily running toward democracy. <clears throat> and so what you have to do is you have to put yourself in other people's shoes for a bit and, and think about where they're coming from. They were under colonialism very recently. They want some kind of democracy. Uh, and it helps if you just look at the people in Tehran, the ones who were beaten and, and imprisoned when they came up uh, and revolted against the, uh, the mullahs there. Uh, these, they now have looked around, they've seen what happens when you have a revolution without democracy in their own country in 1979, or you have a revolution with chaos in Syria. So what they want is they want democracy without a revolution. So you, know, you look at something like this, you say, how do you get there? I don't know how you square these kind of polarities with the situation that's costing us so many innocent people killed and wounded in, in, uh, in Syria. And so I think what you end up doing is you accept that in the short term you may have to make awkward alliances that you may not be real happy with in the long run, but it's always easier to be far from any responsibility and condemn those who tried to deal with it at the time. And so you just do the best you can, and, but never lose sight of what you stand for either. And that's very easily done in the urgency of some things. That's the best answer I can give you. Ladies and gentlemen, I enjoyed every question here today. Thank you very much. And uh, <laughs> we, 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 we.